Hello, and welcome to another episode in trying to understand the clinical examinations with myself, Dr. James Gill. So we're going to be having a look at the cranial nerve examination. Hopefully by now you've already seen the uh, video that we've performed of myself doing the cranial nerve examination. But as I'm sure that as people have noticed, there is no additional dialogue over the top of that video. The main reason being so that it can be used for teaching in multiple different levels, whether or not you're a first year medical student or whether or not you're finally a medical student. In the previous Understanding Clinical Examinations podcast, I did highlight that I'm not a fan of the neurological examination. Well, to be specific, I've got no problem with the examination, but it's some of the very, very high level um, neurology knowledge that I always find a little bit uncomfortable. Thankfully, the cranial nerve exam is a much easier um, well, mental challenge for me to get my head around. And in terms of physically performing the um, 12 uh, different cranial nerve examinations, I've actually kind of enjoyed those. Yes, I've re uh, revised them and learned them by rote, but nevertheless, I still think it's quite an elegant examination. So with that in mind, we're going to turn over to uh, McLeod Clinical Examination, and we're going to go through the um, chapter on the cranial nerve examination. Um, as before, people have asked for a little bit more interjection from myself, so as well as reading through Elsevier's chapters, um, I will give my own opinion and any particular features that I feel are relevant to pay attention to during the examination. And perhaps more hopefully, I'll throw in the odd um, clinical pearl that I've found beneficial when actually interacting with the patient or trying to perform the examination. Okay, so with that, here are the cranial nerves. The 12 pairs of cranial nerves, with the exception of cranial nerve 1, the olfactory nerve, all arise from the brainstem. Cranial nerves 2, 3, 4 and 6 relate to the eye, while 8 relates to hearing and balance. Okay, as far as introductions go, that's terrible. What about the other cranial nerves? Okay, let's go over the summary box instead, because I think that's probably a good introduction, or a better one than they've got there. So cranial nerve 1, the olfactory nerve, this is your sense of smell, and there's an innovation to each nostril. Abnormalities that might be seen would be anosmia or parosmia, so that being when a patient can't smell, or they're smelling things that other people can't. A good example of this might be a patient who's sustained a head injury and when seen in the a &E department cannot smell anymore. The cranial nerve 1, the olfactory nerve, actually goes through the base of the skull at something called the cribiform plate and that allows smell to go up into your nostrils, tickle the nerves and give us the sensation of smell. However, because of these little finger-like protuberances that go through the cribiform plate, they're very, very delicate. And if, as an example, you get a severe blow to the head, which causes the brain to jerk within the skull, those very delicate fibres can be ripped from the cribiform plate, or simply severed, resulting in the loss of smell. Similarly, the parosmere, if a patient has a brain tumour, which is affecting the cranial nerve 1, then they may get abnormal senses of smell. Okay. Cranial nerve 2. This is dealing with visual acuity, um, your visual fields will help control your pupil size and shape, allow your eyes to respond to light reflex, and to ensure a thorough examination must also be examined with direct fundoscopy. Abnormalities that you can see may be partial sight or blindness, a scotoma indicating a partial loss of vision or a blind spot in an otherwise normal field, that's something that I've received in terms of feedback from the previous um, video. Where I'm using clinical terminology, um, I'm going to try and give the actual definition or use of it, because certainly when I was learning, there's nothing worse than having to interrupt your learning experience to go scurrying off to check the dictionary for what hemianopia means. In this particular case, hemianopia means half sight or hemi, half opia sight. But specifically, that would be half of the vision has been lost from a single eye, not that one eye isn't working. 
So for example, if they close their eye, the patient might find that the lateral half of their vision has disappeared, depending on what the underlying pathology was. Another feature that we may see with a cranial nerve 2 lesion is anascoria. If you want a really good clinical example of that, then I'd advise you to have a look at some of the photographs of David Bowie. Not only does he have heterochromia, so different coloured eyes, which is a genetic family trait for himself, but also anascoria, so he has one pupil which is a different size to the other. The reason for that being he had a childhood fight over a girl about the age of 15 and his friend punched him in the eye, scratching um, the eye itself, resulting in damage to the muscle fibres that control his pupil. This dilation of the pupil also has its own medical terminology, that being mydriasis. Seriously, doctors have got a word for everything, and if they haven't, they're probably just going to make it up. Other problems with cranial nerve 2 might also cause issues with the optic disc and retinal changes. Cranial nerve 3, or the ocular motor nerve, is responsible for light and accommodation reflex, that being the pupil changing size to help you focus on something which is near and far away. And if there's any problem there, then you're going to have a loss of light reflex to the eye. So when performing the cranial nerve examination, you should shine a light in the patient's eye, whereupon you would expect to see their pupils constrict if cranial nerve 3 was functioning correctly. Hold on, doesn't that clash with the fact that we've just said that cranial nerve 2 could have issues with anascoria? Okay. We will go into this in more detail in a moment, but suffice to say that cranial nerve 2 is saying, I have this signal, and cranial nerve 3 is acting on that signal, which is why they can both have problems with the pupils. However, cranial nerve 3 also has additional functions, along with the cranial nerve 4, that being the trochlea, and cranial nerve 6, the abducens. They're involved in eye position and movements of the eye, where a patient who may have a difficulty here may have strabismus, or a squint, diplopia, so double vision, or nystagmus, which is the rhythmic beating of the eye at the very extremes of gaze. So if, for example, you to keep your head still and look all the way to the left, as you strain your eyes to the left, your eye should remain static. Somebody with nystagmus, their eye would bounce a little bit side to side at that very extreme. Cranial nerve 5, or the trigeminal nerve, is responsible for facial sensation, the corneal reflex, basically blinking if something touches your eye, the muscles of mastication, i.e. those you chew with, and a jaw jerk reflex. In terms of abnormalities might be seen, you may get simple impairment, so difficulty feeling with one area of the face, along with weaknesses in chewing if there was a lesion affecting the trigeminal nerve. Whilst the trigeminal nerve deals with sensation of the face, the slightly confusingly named facial nerve, or cranial nerve 7, deals with the muscles of expression, so smiling, grimacing, etc. It also provides a small sensory component, giving taste over the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. If we had issues with cranial nerve 7, we may see facial weakness or problems with loss of taste. Classically, a stroke is seen to present with a facial nerve weakness. Similarly, a Bell's palsy, a lower motor neuron lesion affecting the facial nerve, will again affect expression, but this expression will be slightly different and crucially so compared to that which is seen with a stroke. It is arguable that cranial nerve 8 is one of the most important cranial nerves. The vestibular cochlear nerve is vital for hearing, but also balance. If there are problems with the cranial nerve 8, then you may have hearing or straightforward deafness. We may have nystagmus, and most troubling for patients, problems with the vestibular cochlear nerve may cause vertigo. Cranial nerve 9, or the glossopharyngeal nerve, provides pharyngeal sensation and is not routinely tested. Cranial nerve 10, or the vagus nerve, is involved with palatine movements, so the ability to phonate and the movement of the soft palate. 
If this is tested, it's using a pen torch and simply getting the patient to say ah whilst looking at the top of their mouth. The penultimate cranial nerve, cranial nerve 11, or the spinal accessory nerve, is required for movement of the trapezius and the sternomastoid muscles. If there is a lesion affecting this nerve, we will see weakness in the scapula and neck movements. Finally, the hypoglossal or 12th nerve, this is involved in tongue appearance, i.e. sticking your tongue out, and also movements of the tongue. Problems with cranial nerve 12 or the hypoglossal nerve may cause dysarthria, where a person has problems making the sounds of words. They may also have issues with chewing and or swallowing, as the tongue is exceptionally important in the act of eating and mobilising a bolus of food around the mouth and initiating the swallowing process. So there's a brief summary of the overview of the cranial nerves and how these cranial nerves interact and the functions that they provide for the head and neck. In the next video we're going to be looking at the specifics of the examinations of the cranial nerves and what abnormalities we might find here. I've changed things around in this video and tried to split the sections into different videos rather than loading everything into one session. So I'd be very grateful for your feedback as to whether or not you prefer the longer video where everything is packed into one session or prefer the idea of splitting things into an overview and then the focus on the examination afterwards. Okay, hope you have a good evening and if I could uh, Please ask you kindly if you found this useful, please give it a like below and certainly subscribe and then you'll get a heads up when the next um, video is published, hopefully um, in the week. Okay, thanks very much. See you later. Bye.